Welcome to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thank you so much for joining us, as always, here on this program. Uh, this is always, for me, a delight to uh, to talk with our various guests and have these conversations to talk about the things that, at least from my perspective, are important uh, and uh, make a difference in making this a better place, a better world for all of us. Today, we're going to be talking with Suzanne Taylor. Uh, she's been involved with films uh, since she graduated um, Phi Beta Kappa. My father actually graduated that back from uh, junior college back in the 70s. Uh, she also had um, summa cum laude from uh, NYU. Uh, she's been involved. She's been an actress. She's done commercials. She's 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 done all kinds of other things. And one of the th intriguing aspects we're going to talk to her about, in addition to among other things, uh, she's uh, created a feature documentary on crop circles, Quest for Truth. Uh, she's produced and directed. Um, uh, she's uh, uh, been the producer and director of What on Earth? Inside the uh, Inside the Crop Circle Mystery. I'm I'm intrigued by that because I've seen a lot of them and I've heard a lot of different explanations and and I think it'll be a lot of fun. And I want to thank you so much, Suzanne, for joining us here on the program. Well, I love talking about um, saving the world. <laughs> Absolutely, that's well, kind of the, that's kind of the umbrella for all of it. Well, I've often said that uh, we're looking for those new ways of living because the old ways don't work. All you have to do is look around; they aren't working, and they can work for everybody. But we've got to come up with those new ways, and I know that's what you're about as well. Um, uh, you're you're also involved in um, uh, something. Uh, you, you, matter of fact, I believe, if I'm correct, uh, you gave a talk on the future of the new age. Now, I remember sort of being introduced to that back in the 80s uh, in reference primarily to what was called the harmonic convergence. And, yeah. And I I found it interesting. I wasn't a hundred percent certain about what it was back then. I, I understand it now. And I've been introduced to so many different people. Uh, when we talk about, for example, um, the impact and the effects of sound. Now, these days I talk with a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Goldman, but back then I was listening to the music of people like Stephen Halpern, who I've actually had on the program uh, a few year, a couple of years ago, I had him on the program. I'm grateful that he is still alive and producing as well. And then there's also the visual arts. And uh, I, I sit there and I take a look at uh, like these awards shows, you know, where they're judging, oh, well, this is the best and that's not the best. And so on. And I'm thinking it's art. It's in the eye of the beholder. But I learned something the other day that, hey, you know, it's not about that. It's that they're... They're getting recognition for bringing this talent, if you will, this ability, this skill, this intuitive expression out into the material world for other people to experience and to maybe be inspired by. Do you feel that a lot of what you have done over the years maybe has done that, that not only has inspired others, but maybe through what you have been doing, it's actually inspired you to just kind of keep going up and up and up to, to new levels. Well, what is the it art? Uh, you know, whether, well, whatever it is that you have been involved in, whether it's been um, in movies or television or commercials or making these documentaries, because I am very interested. We'll talk about the crop circles uh, as well. Uh, but it just seems like, uh, you you've you've been involved in so many different things well they're all the same thing in a way and they are are different things you know mm -hmm. i don't have um a specialty when when i was in school i was good at everything you know that's phi beta kappa summa cum laude that means you get 100 on everything virtually and uh uh I never did follow anything. Um, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not uh, an Olympic athlete. <laughs> you know, I just know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, you might say I'm a generalist. Um, and, you know, I'm old enough that uh, my life started when you were supposed to be a housewife when you were a woman. Uh, <laughs> I was not thinking about, I was thinking about playing golf and having babies and 
playing bridge and mm. oh my god i can't imagine that life now um so lots of years ago i tuned into this budding consciousness movement which we used to call the human potential movement yeah. And uh, at some point, the husband left, or I left, and uh, I just tuned myself into all this amazing new world. You know, when I graduated from college, um, with the highest marks, you know, then I needed to get a job. I got married right after college to my college sweetheart. So, uh, <laughs> but I needed, we needed salary, you know, I needed a job. Mm -hmm. And even though I was an, a drama major, you know, I, that was not a steady job, Uh so um, I started, I couldn't get a job. And somebody said to me, well, you know, you have to go to secretarial school. You have to learn stenography. <laughs> you know, I could be a brain surgeon. What am I doing? Go I don't want to go to secretarial school. Anyway, so I, you know, got through that. But, but I, the housewifey thing was a strong pull. Um, as an actress that I did go on to have a career, uh, I was most successful making commercials because you could do them in a day or two. They wouldn't take me away from my housewife stuff. But then at some point, uh, I, life, you know, the the world came along pointing in new directions. And I just got plugged into all of that. And mm. uh, and so here I am. I still don't have a career. I'm still not an Olympic athlete. I'm not. So I've just, you know, done what's kind of come up. Um, I've been very lucky in that uh, my my, my ex-husband was a very successful television guy. And um, so when I got out of the, and I was an actress, I had income also. So when I got out of the marriage, I didn't have to have a job anymore, a day job. Uh, I, I had enough money coming in from the residuals and acting and whatever uh, that that I that I could do whatever I wanted to do and what I wanted to do was actually devour all of this uh way to kind of become another person and uh uh tune into these things that were so meaningful and that made sense of the world you know as long as I was focused on the babies I wasn't thinking about making sense of the world but then then that became paramount what the heck is going on here it's, yeah. it's all about money. No, that's not what brings happiness and satisfaction. So as, you know, life has gone on, I've gone from kind of one project to another project. And that's where you see this whole array of different kinds of things I've done. They all kind of make sense. If you go, well, why'd you do this one? Well, that came out of the other one, whatever. And uh, movies were among them. You know, how do you tell, how do you give the world information? How do you change its mind, make movies. And when I discovered the crop circles, uh, which was, you know, uh, back, uh, that was, that occupied me a lot during um, the early 20th century, <laughs> 21st mm. century. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 2003, yeah, 2003 was when I made my first visit to the crop circles. And, uh, I came back thinking, oh, my God, the world has to know what's going on. It, 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 the evidence seemed to be that we were being visited. Uh, look at the evidence, you know. We couldn't do that. And um, so I came back. I said, uh, on the way back, I said, what? I got to, I'll make movies. That's the way you tell the world things. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it was not so unfamiliar to me. I've been in front of cameras now for, you know, some years and just had to go to the other side of the camera Uh uh, and that, you know, if we actually believed that we were being visited, that there's another intelligence, not even necessarily extraterrestrial, another dimension, another, the future coming back, you know, do we understand the big picture, the biggest picture? Here we are, you know, yeah. how did, we get here? How did everything get here, you know? Uh, so, uh, the, the, you know, I, if if we truly believed, if it were the the New York Times says another intelligence is absolutely here. We are not the only intelligence. Not only that, we wouldn't be the greatest intelligence because they're visiting us. We're not visiting them, so they're ahead of us in significant yeah. ways. And 
you know, here we are, we're so arrogant. You know, we own everything. We're, you know, we should be a humanitarian species. We're an economic species. It's all about money, not about love. Yeah. And, you know, it's not doing very well by us. Uh, so if we, if we were humble, you know, like, oh, it's not all us. Wait, wait, we have to take our place in the scheme of things. And mm -hmm. it would just permeate the, the, the world. It would be a, a single thing that everyone in the world would be aware of. And, you know, when, when Galileo and Copernicus changed the cosmic order of things, it changed our society here. We went from kings and serfs to kind of democracy in a simplistic kind mm -hmm. of way to describe it. And the same thing would happen... Well, the same kind of thing would happen if we discovered there's another intelligence. We'd have to adjust to that in our whole way of being. And so that's what intrigued me. And that's what got me so plugged into doing that and, you know, ending up making two movies uh, on the subject. By the way, the second one, the one that I was the filmmaker for, um, got a good review in the New York Times, which was like like a little miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still couldn't, you know, parlay it to get really super popular, you know, so that yeah. everyone would be buzzing about it and more investigation would go on. Um, eventually, eventually, well, long, longer stories than possibly we want to take our time for, but the whole phenomenon seemed to uh, take a, 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 a turn into human made. Um, you, humanity got to do what it does, which is compete with each other, uh, climb all over each other. And this lovely community of researchers, which would gather in uh, England every summer that I was part of and I was filming, mm -hmm. uh, they were cooperative. They were excited. They were sharing information until they weren't. And then they were competitive and <laughs> trying to knock each other out of the box, the main uh person who takes the pictures the aerial pictures mm -hmm. reported the second person to the aerial commission so that they would not let her fly and you know it got ugly and you know if i were this phenomenon coming from elsewhere to help us which is my belief although there's got this prime directive where nothing comes and fixes you you just kind of get some kind of assistance um they seem to be saying, hey, you're not the only intelligence. Look, we'll demonstrate with this awesome artwork in the fields, you know. Mm. Uh, so um, the, 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 if, I, if I were that intelligence and I saw how these humans ended up behaving after a few years of awesome being impressed by us, now they're arguing among themselves, they're fighting, they're you know, uh, uh, it, it unpleasant. And wait a minute, we're going to take our no pearls before swines. We're taking this away. Yeah. And I think that's what happened. I think uh, the last few years, um, it, it, they've all been he human made. And the humans got better and better at replicating what they couldn't do before uh, and what wasn't theirs to begin with. It was they became copiers of something that was happening. Um, and I think the last few years, they got very, very good at making them look good. And, and if you saw my movie, you'd see from the air, you can't tell anything other than shape. And they got very good at laying out these geometric shapes. When you were in them, it, it was another kind of story. Oh, this is all messy. The, the real ones are very smooth. And, you know, there were other kinds of... Um, ways that you know you you could tell the difference uh but again they got better and better the humans at making them really look and i think that's all that's going on now now i think it's just all people making them so i've moved on uh i i, I just couldn't couldn't make that one change the world yeah uh, so onward <laughs> yeah and it, it it can be a struggle but at the same time we can't let it stop us uh, from making that change and uh, uh, doing what we can to make the change in the world. 
Well, I'm just on to other ways to do it. You yeah, know? Exactly. We've got to find yeah. other ways to do it. You're absolutely right. And maybe well, this one will come back now that there's UFO interest again. Yeah. UFOs and crop circles kind of went together, even though they don't necessarily come from there. But all the UFO conferences, I spoke at a lot of them. And I showed my movie at a lot of them. And um, they, the UFO people, you know, consider the crop circles to kind of be a subset of theirs. Yeah. Um so well what but, i find what i find interesting is uh, the hearings that they held the government hearings that they yeah. held uh, back last year um made me think of an author who um uh, i didn't get a, i haven't had a chance to interview i hope maybe one day too uh, but he wrote this book called ad after disclosure and in the book he talks about how once this information is disclosed it's going to literally change everything it's changed our exactly. religion change our economy that 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 yes. that 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 and I had already formulated my first question to him. Uh, and I'm hoping, like I said, I get a chance to interview him because I would start with this question. What makes you think that the American people are going to believe the government is now telling us the truth since they've been lying to us for 60 years? It may, you know, that's like, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would I believe you? You've you've been putting us off. You've been lying to us. You've been classifying it as top secret on and on. Operation Blue Book, etc. Whatever you want to talk about. And now all of a sudden, oh, yeah, only here's the twist. They're acknowledging we're not alone, but now they're making them out to be our enemy. And I say, look, if they can travel intergalactically here, you and I wouldn't even be having this interview. It would be over if they were here to subjugate us. It, we'd be done. Yeah. So sure. I'm sure. not afraid. As a matter of fact, I've I've heard of, and you're probably familiar with this as well. Um, well how you know there are five levels of contact. There's uh, uh you know, obviously uh the movie um uh um what is it? Uh, contact of uh, I can't even remember the title of the movie now with Richard Dreyfus. Uh, uh, uh I'm sorry. Close encounters. Close encounters of the third kind, third right? Kind, yeah. But then there's the close encounter of the fourth and then of the fifth. And I'm sitting here with the fifth going, please take me. I've had enough of this place. I'll go, uh, you know, wh wherever you're going, I'm ready to go. Uh, I want to experience something completely different. Watch what you ask for. I, I know. But at the same time that I have to wonder too, because I'm, I'm very much the metaphysician, uh, who believes that, number one, there's this whole aspect of divine right timing, okay, if that were to happen, but also uh, one's life's purpose. That may have nothing to do with why I'm here. Why I'm here is probably, at least for the time being, what I'm doing now, talking with you, uh, Suzanne Taylor, uh, about uh, uh, these these different areas. And Again, I, I think you said it well. You know, we're, we're very arrogant to think if, if, to keep continuing to think that we're we're the only quote unquote intelligent beings in the universe. Um, I think that uh, one of the one of the jokes that I saw <laughs> the the aliens will come flying by. They'll do a little uh, survey and so forth, and uh, decide that there is no intelligence intelligent life on Earth, and keep on going. <laughs> That's a good you know, just completely keep on going. But I've also heard it said too, and maybe the because the crop circles, as you have, have documented, <clears throat> they're all over the globe. They're everywhere. Um, some have speculated, and I'm curious as to your observations, because I uh, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, I have not seen your documentary yet. At least I don't think I have, but I'm going to. But some have speculated. That is, is actually there's a language in there. They're they're actually trying to tell us something, not, not just by the appearance of the crop circle, but there's something in the geometry. There's something in the design. There's a message there. Is that something that you have investigated at all? Well, there's no overall. Yes, this is a category. Definitely you're in something that's something. Um, there's no overall this is the message but individual formations have information in them they're not just pretty pictures you know uh different kinds of information there's even 
don't ask me what ASCII code is, but uh, I, I, know, I know what has been reported. So in ASCII code, you can read in several of them, two or three of them, actual translations of messages by the way the little props are laid down. They're like, you know, messages. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I mean, you see that something is funny. It's not part of the geometric picture. There's right. writing going on, but it's not writing you can decipher, except it has been deciphered as ASCII code. And messages like, you're not alone, uh, uh, danger ahead, uh, watch out, uh, uh, things like that. And, and, and then, you know, that, that world of crop circle content is fascinating. We, we could do a whole program about that, the different kinds of things, not just, yeah. that's a more sort of obvious thing of, you can see something that looks like a message in another language and it can get translated, but, uh, there are fascinating stories about, uh, oh my gosh, look what's in that one. And that corresponds to some event, like we're about to have an eclipse on earth and some crop circle comes in with a, um, the way the crop is laid down, it's an eclipse that's going on. You can see it. Half the thing is in the shadow and half isn't. Mm -hmm. and it's almost like they're saying, you see, you see, we see you, we recognize you. So you see us recognizing you, you know, there's like a connection going on, as I say, not just pretty patterns. Right. Uh, so, there's, you know, again, we could do a whole program about all of that. So. Well, it's, it's, to me, it's fascinating uh, it just in terms of the fact that they are, they <laughs> are uh, showing themselves through these different methods uh, and, and revealing the fact that, you're not alone, uh, but you're sort of on a collision course with uh, your, your. I can't remember if it's your fifth or your sixth extinction event. If you don't get your act together. Uh, yeah, see, I think what you're, what you're talking about is the overall, what's the over, not, not the specific message of do this, do that. Right, right. The overall thing is you're not alone. There, we are another intelligence. We're giving you evidence, evidence, evidence. Mm -hmm. We see you. Uh, we wish well for you. You know, there's no more direct intervention, but it's kind of, it's almost like they're not allowed to come in and fix things, but they're there to kind of push us or inspire us, you know? Right. It's that sense about it all. And that's why it's such a shame that it all fell apart because it was so beautiful and hopeful and yeah. exciting you know until it wasn't <laughs> so. yeah what what i find interesting too is is this aspect of of um the the uh, the discovery of these these circles and then the um the dismantling of the reality of, of them and you know it's, oh yeah these are fake and here's the reason how they how these were made and so forth and i would look at so many of these matter of fact i have one of these giant coffee table type books that i was given right. not too long ago and i'm looking through them and you don't see anywhere in the rest of the field where this crop circle is an entry point or exit point and it's like okay so how did they get in and out of there Some if of this them. is fake yeah. yeah, I know some of them were, and they I don't know how they did it, but they managed to do it. Uh, but that was one of the things that always uh, was perplexing to me. It's like, okay, I, and of course, we're, you know, getting into more of the literal aspects of it. Um, how did they get in there to do this and then get out without leaving a trace? You know, well, that's just one of the kind of things that you say, we can't do that, you know, uh, that leads you, well, something else is doing that then what's that, you know? Yeah. 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 That it's was really, it was really thrilling to be part of that during its heyday. It really yeah. was. May I ask what you thought of those hearings uh, by uh, Congress uh, back, I guess it was just late last year, or maybe it was early. I can't even remember when they were because it wasn't that important to me because I'm going, so what if you guys tell us, oh yeah, they're real. Now I'm not, I'm not saying that the people who testified weren't telling the truth. I'm not even talking about them. 
I'm talking about Congress, who's decided to hold one of these UFO hearings. And then, of course, they keep renaming these things. OK, uh, but what did you what was your impression when you uh, heard and maybe even saw some of this that was going on? Well, in some ways, it's an interesting question. You don't know why it would be interesting. Um, but uh, first of all, I'm not a really UFO person, and I'm very aware of those hearings. Um, and I think they were very impressive. Uh, the world wasn't listening, <laughs> but I think they were very impressive. Uh, possibly their downfall was the person who conducted them, who was quite a scoundrel. And that world is full of scoundrels also. And um, so I think I'm thinking anything he would do would fail <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to go there, but uh, no, no, we won't. But they were impressive. But, you know, it's very hard to uh, get people out of the materialist world. You know, we're so attached to this hard, you know, economic world we're in. And when you just start to think about what's beyond, it's not an easy uh, thing to get accepted but but more and more you know early on in the new age it was all kooky kooky you know weirdo but it's not that anymore it's quite uh you know we, we are we are aware much more aware many more people aware that it's not just um hardcore material stuff that we live in uh consciousness and that's not that's not a uh something to be ridiculed anymore you know yeah uh, so we move we move we move you know we get wiser all the time well i'd like to think <laughs> yeah no I, we do we, i'd like well, to think in a so. way we get wiser yeah. but you know the world also progresses by problems if everything were beautiful and wonderful we wouldn't advance we yeah. advance because something doesn't work and then we make it work and you know, it's back and forth, bad, good, bad, good, all the while going forward. And, um, and here we're in a real bad <laughs> of the bad good. And in a way, well, maybe this will be the big turning point because we can't keep going the way we are. This is, uh, you know, some we're, we're headed for so many disasters that if we don't become a cooperative humanity, one of them will will get us and we'll have something catastrophic that will go on. Uh, and what is urgent is that we become a caring world and not a world that's competing. And competing's fine, you know, at a level of uh, artistry and what have yeah. you, but, but not competing where so much of the world is in survival and wars go on and, you know, that's the way we win and, uh, you know, it's we're quite brutal and it's too late for us to be brutal because we're so good at it. <laughs> you know, we're so good at destruction that yeah. we better get in a peaceful path or um, trouble ahead. We're talking with uh, Suzanne Taylor uh, about uh, a lot of different things that she's been involved in lately. She's been working on helping to change as, as is phrased here, change the world view. And uh, sometimes it takes one person at a time, by the way, uh, she has what's called Sue Speaks, and uh, that is actually an acronym. And uh, uh, I, I find I, I thought it was really kind of cute uh, uh, little acronym uh, in terms of uh, uh, it's a digital meeting place for high minded people to be inspired and to engage with each other. Uh, and the goal is to help shift our worldview from being primarily about self-service to where caring about each other is as important as caring about ourselves. Uh, and uh, I, I just really find it interesting that over the years, and I'm only 64, so I haven't been here that long, but over the years, I've noticed that the one time, the one time, that we are able to, uh, that we 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 step across, out, step outside of our egos, to help others, is in time of disaster. Absolutely. And then when the disaster is over and we've rebuilt and so, we're back to the same, and and they want to move, they want us to colonize Mars with this. 
I don't think so, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, unless we can resolve these issues within within ourselves. And by the way, SUE, S-U-E, speaks, actually stands for searching for unity in everything. Yep, uh, that's true. <laughs> and quantum physics and physics and quantum physics and science has already proven that everything that exists is connected and that it is all the same thing, energy. It's all energy. And you can't destroy energy. You can only transform it. And that's really what we're talking about here. And I think that, uh, for example, Jesus said it quite well, uh, that uh, um, the works that I do, you will do, but you will do greater works than these. And I honestly do believe that greater work is the transforming of our own lives and the lives of the people around us. Not by proselytizing and saying you're not saved and that, that, that. No, by example. And people will see how you live and say, hey, I want some of that. And then you have the opportunity to share with them how to do it. And that's what you're doing, isn't it? Well, I do it from a basis of uh, not so much uh, that kind of an individual person, me, you, everyone being nicer, kinder, and will be good examples. I do it uh, from a scientific understanding uh, that actually we've only had for the last hundred years. Although before that, you see, I think people like Jesus were mystics, not gods. And they saw yes. through material reality somehow. They broke through this shell and 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 connected to what's beyond it. Like for instance, we do on psychedelics. We're we, we go. We're not in this world on psychedelics. Oh, there's another world. Just as for the dramatic way, you can kind of get an insight into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think all of those uh, god figures were mystics and. Um, we'd been much better off if we'd seen them that way rather than worshiping them, that they gave us insight into the bigger picture that we're all part of. Um, but in the last hundred years, we got scientific evidence of what those mystics got somehow, maybe through psychedelics. You know, they've been around <laughs> since the beginning of time. We don't talk about that much, but all indigenous societies had their shamans and they brought back from that world how to live in this one. Um, but um, the the hundred hundred years ago, we didn't even know there was a second galaxy. We thought this was it. And we thought the whole universe was fixed. It was set. It was solid. We were on Earth. And we were here to use it. A you know, mm -hmm. hundred years ago, Hubble changed everything. Yeah. In the scientific understanding, mm -hmm. Hubble showed us that they were no, not just one galaxy, tried two trillion. <laughs> you imagine. So now we're in a universe. Oh, my God, there's two trillion galaxies and it's not fixed. It's moving in. It's expanding. It started somewhere. Uh, the Big Bang. So it started and everything was there. And it grew and grew and everything's still there, but developing and evolving, all connected. You know, not we're not outside looking at something. We're inside becoming something. Um, so that's the fundamental understanding that needs a new story. We need a planetary story. Who are we as a planetary civilization? Mm -hmm. Right now, we're a selfish economic you know, civilization where we're using the earth and we'll get from it what we can and we'll war with each other to get more. No, no, no. We're part of a much bigger, bigger enterprise. And it, as, as we come to internalize that and get this energy that we're all part of and that's what my my commitment now is to teach the this new creation story every culture has a creation story who are you where'd you come from what are you all about well in this new story where one humanity 
here to engage with each other. And if we got that, that we're here to help each other, not to hurt each other, uh, everything would change. Yeah. So we, we desperately need a planetary creation story. That's my whole dedication now, how to bring about this new understanding. Well, you know, um, a couple of things real quickly tying into what you've just shared. Number one, for about a year and a half back in the, uh, I'm going to say mid 90s, I was a member of the Baha'i faith. Ah, uh, Yes, beautiful. And, and one of the things that Baha'u'llah, the founder of that faith, said was that if you reject one of the messengers of God, you reject them all. If you accept one of the messengers of God, you accept them all. That was one. But there was another phrase that was born out when we started launching rockets into orbit around the earth and we were taking pictures of the earth from space, it confirmed what he said, Baha'u'llah said, that there are no borders. I mean, I've looked at pictures of the globe close up. I don't see any, none whatsoever. Now, if I was looking, let's say, at the island of Ireland, all right, yeah, I see borders, but what I see are stone fences around the properties that people own. But this is to the other point that you made earlier. There's a beautiful song by Mary Black, Irish a singer. The line is this, and I, I, I understand how people feel when it comes to property rights in this country as the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all of that stuff. But Mary Black, and she probably got it from an old Irish saying or, or a, a Celtic saying, you don't own the land. The land owns you. And when I first heard that, I thought, wow, that's true. I, I So I have a deed. So what? I still, because in a thousand years, I'm not going to be here. This house, whatever the structure, it's probably going to have crumbled to the ground. Everything's going to have changed. Who knows? Maybe it'll be overgrown the entire place a block or the entire neighborhood, the entire city may be taken over by nature, et cetera, et cetera. You don't own any of this, as you said. And it says, uh, even in this, in what I like to call the ancient wisdom teachings, we're supposed to be stewards, not controllers, not owners, you know? And it also touched, I also remember an old Testament saying too, that there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing has come out of a vacuum with maybe, because I don't know this, I wasn't there. Maybe the Big Bang came out of a vacuum. I don't know. Okay. And, and we're not going there. But all philosophy is nothing more. Each philosophical concept grew out of the previous one grew out of the previous one, et cetera, and where we are today. So what you're talking about in terms of writing, uh, creating if you, if I can use that word, a new creation story. Uh, and I don't mean to be crass here, but when I read the old Testament and Genesis and Adam and Eve, and then the, the, the offspring, I can only come to one conclusion when it comes to the offspring of Adam and Eve and how we now have 8 billion, 8.1 billion people. I checked yesterday. God had no problem with what we call incest. There's no other explanation. Unless there were others that were created along with Adam and Eve that we don't read about. So there are so many inconsistencies in that regard. So when it comes to writing a new creation story, if you will, and, and using that as sort of the framework... What have you come up with in that regard? Have have you formulated anything yet or are you still working on that? Or are there others that are working on developing a new, again, and we'll use that term, the new creation story, a new paradigm, as we like to talk about, looking for a new paradigm for a new world? Well, I wouldn't say there are others working on establishing it. We have it. The question is getting it to be understood. Um, you know, the 
this the new story is of us as one humanity by verified by science. Science is our God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, science verifies that, you know, we are in the soup together. There is mm -hmm. soup. Uh, and and again, you know, that would change everything. Uh, it, it, it's not about a world where we're climbing over each other, which was all part of, you know, the undivided planet. And then people came along and they grabbed and they grabbed and they grabbed and divided up and divided up. And then the richer we got, the more divided we got. We built these houses, nuclear us, you know, in our rich society. We're all separated from one another. Loneliness is epidemic now. <laughs> you know, it's not, this has not altogether been good. And, you know, the indigenous societies, they didn't own anything. Indian, the American Indians, they didn't own their teepee land or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were part of nature. They were part of the oneness of it all. And, you know, we just got more and more sophisticated and it allowed us to separate from one another. And, you know, in some ways it's wonderful. Look at our beautiful civilization in the ways in which it's beautiful. Oh my goodness. You know, I, I, I like my world. I, I didn't want to live in indigenous society with no electricity. You know, I like my world. But, you know, it, it's come with at a price. Uh, and really, in a way, we just have to get back to where we were, not not back in a recessive way where we don't have technology anymore. Right. But back to that primal understanding of our connection to one another. It's still there. We just obliterated it. We just don't understand it. And we don't operate by it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that we are making war. I, I mean, Richard, it... it, it it's unfathomable that yeah. we actually kill each other intentionally. Uh, and then we have all this argument about saving embryos. <laughs> you know, we're killing millions of people with guns and no, but we have to save those embryos. We were really quite crazy. The, the hypocrisy is just incredible, isn't it? And incredible. it's and it's not and it's not hidden. It's overt. It's it's right out yes. there for everyone to see. Exactly. I've, I've even been asked, um, for example, you know, obviously in these in these times, we're always asked, "What side are you on?" And when I when I uh, think about, for example, uh, using one of our conflicts that's going on in the Middle East, uh, you know, "What side are you on?" I said. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. And the reason I say that is because they are both utilizing methods that have never worked. And the reason I know this is because they're still using them and they haven't achieved their respective goals. Now, maybe for a period of time and the same thing with what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine, it's the same methods. I, 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 when the whole thing started a couple of years ago, um, I said, if I had the wherewithal, I would get a, a round trip ticket to Moscow, get off the plane, head right for the Kremlin, go in there, get out of my way. You can't stop me. I would grab that little nut. That's what I refer to him as that little nut ball by the ear and say, "Uh, uh, your mother is ashamed of you. This is not the way we play in the 21st century. You are on permanent timeout. And I'm not saying we need to kill him. That we're not. That is part of the old paradigm. Uh, he gets a little time out. Okay. Maybe a couple of decades. Okay. You don't get to associate with anybody. You get to go to the gulag. Okay. How about Siberia? Okay. Where you've been sending all kinds of other people. Now you get to share in the same treatment you've been doing to others. And, uh, but you're not going to die. We're going to feed you. We're going to take care of you, but we don't play like this in the 21st century. This is not the game. And, and then you talked about our economic system. It's like, if we're so, so wise and so intelligent and so smart why have we not come up with a better more equitable economic system and everybody said well but it's so complicated you can't just automatically and i loved what one of my guests said about the institutions they said do not tear down the old institutions create new ones that make the old ones obsolete yeah are yeah. we? Are you seeing that? That's happen? Buckminster Fuller. I'm Buck, Buckminster Fuller. Okay, I'll give him credit. I I didn't say it. I quote that a lot. So good. Oh, excellent. I will continue to do so. Uh, are you seeing that uh, on the fringes, or are we seeing more of that 
building of new institute. I, I don't know if cryptocurrency is part of that new institution economically or not, but in terms of new religious institutions, new educational institutions, uh, new communities. Have you ever heard of uh, Jacques Fresco, a gentleman who created yeah. what's called the Venus Project? He was a futurist and an architect who designed all kinds of incredible cities that had a central hub. If you wanted to own a car, you could, but you wouldn't have to because you would be living a, a fair distance away from where you worked. Although, would you say that the paradigm has changed, especially when it comes to work, because of or maybe in spite of, I don't know which way, of COVID and the and the lockdown? I mean, our work environment has has shifted. I mean, that to me is that's huge. Well, one of the things, you know, the uh, category to focus on is the the way we do things that we do it this way, we do it that way, fix that, change that. But what I focus on is what's making all those things not work. Uh, what's causal? What, how can you like, you know, if, if the crop circle situation had turned out to prove we have another intelligence that would change everything. Well, what would change everything now? And that's what I keep looking at. And to me, the main thing that would change everything that 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 could happen, uh, because if we change the economy of the world, that would change everything too. Mm -hmm, if we mm -hmm. brought everybody out of poverty, and that would change everything. But that's you know the complexity of government and you know dense reality. But if we change our mind, if we change our understanding, if we know we're here as one humanity, uh, we will behave differently about everything. We'll we'll make everything conform. If we're one humanity in this grand game, we're here to help the earth. In fact, you know, you talk about uh, these God creatures. Uh, to me, so what's God? We know now, you know, we don't think the long white beard anymore. But mm -hmm. what is it? What, is, what are we talking about? And I think it's the whole cosmos. It's a such a, it's a sacred situation. Uh, sacred in that it's it's beyond any of us it's so vast and so awesome yeah it's all sacred and that means we're sacred and as sacred creatures we're here to take care of it you know not to make our way and beat everybody else but to make it all wonderful for everybody so so as we think so we act and if we really adhere that's what i say i'm into my main commitment is what can I do to imbue everyone with this understanding of being sacred creatures here to take care of the earth? Uh, it's not my idea, it's science. Uh, and we just haven't caught up with it yet. We haven't, you know, our beliefs haven't caught up with what we're so, you know, locked into in the way we do things. Uh, but it is just a, a, an understanding. So if you go, oh, that's how it is, you know, and, and what are we all doing here? You're saying, what's your purpose? Well, we can all look at our purposes. I'm here to do all these wonderful projects. But I think our purpose is to evolve, all of us. You know, we, 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 we and we do, you know, we're no, we don't have slaves anymore. Women's Lib changed my life. That was in my lifetime, a mm -hmm. radical change in society. We do learn. You know, we do we do improve. And now mm -hmm. we're at another turning point. We've just got to get this next phase, you know, to, to take us out of this deadening sadness of, of egos and superficiality and all the ways in which we hurt each other and get the idea that we're all connected and that it's a beautiful thing to be human where, you know, the other animals can't affect the earth. They, they're on instinct. We have the privilege of self-awareness and capacity to, you know, make things and change things and hurt things and make them wonderful. Oh, we're, we are glorious as human beings when we understand what the fundamentals are, what our potentials are. And, you know, when, 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 you, when you get a good storyteller for the new story, uh, the new creation story, uh, it, it it takes you over. It changes you. Uh, and that's what we need to do for everyone. Everyone needs to kind of get it. And once they get it, they'll fix everything, you know? So I'm into getting it, you know? Mm. Oh, I, you and me both. I, uh, I don't want to be left behind. 
I mean, okay, yes, I did say that, uh, you know, if the aliens came with the mothership, uh, I'm on board. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I'm not packing any bags, okay? Uh, I don't think I need anything, you know? I don't think I don't think I need anything, uh, but the thing that that is so intriguing to me and I, I when I do these programs, uh, uh, Suzanne, the universe asks the questions. I'm just along for the ride, and at the same time, I have a very curious mind, um, and I I don't necessarily have answers, but I tend to bring up the ironies similar to some of the things that I've brought up that it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Like even what you brought up, we're killing all these people, but we got to save the embryos. Excuse me. I, I, and then uh, the, the whole issue that we had uh, over the last few decades uh, when it came to same sex individuals. Right. And, and uh, I remember a, a rabbi and by the way, those are my favorite interviews of all time interviewing rabbis because I know of the study that they go through. And he says, do you know the context under which that law in Leviticus says that a man is supposed to lie with a man and so forth? He says, well, no, I, I can't say as I do. And he says, it's because it was created so as not to interfere with the procreative process of man. So I'm thinking, okay, that was written way back, you know, in BC, allegedly. All right, we'll, we'll take it at face value. Here we are with 8.1 billion people. Do you honestly believe that we have interfered with the procreative process of man? I don't think so. Again, another one of those ironies. Well, you know, you have to have your understanding of everything conform to your what you've discovered in this wonderful mechanical world we live in that, you know, where you do learn yeah, uh, how the body works, biology, things you, you didn't know before, you know. And um, so, you know, we, we 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 are we do get wiser along the way. We just haven't yeah. got the big package yet. Right. Of, uh, a peaceful world where we're I mean, can you just imagine if we all were devoted to making it a better world? Everyone on Earth, it would be paradise. It would. We have all ways to do that, you know, uh, and yet insanity you know i i i someday i i want to i'd love to have a conversation about what do you do when an aggressor uh, uh comes against you uh what do you do when putin does what he does you you, you fight back well yeah you have to well, wait a minute you know then then you all get destroyed but but it is a question what do you do when one aggressor goes crazy and um tries to take over the world what what do you do other than shoot him <laughs> you know shoot, get your guns out yeah. uh, but but that that you know that just destroys us all and it's yeah. i've never heard people really get down with what to do all as an alternative well you have to fight back well wait a minute, that's just going to destroy everything. Yeah. But what do you do? It's not an easy question. It's not like, oh, well, what you should do is this. Well, <laughs> wait a minute, I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. But I, we should talk about that. You know, I, but lately I've just been thinking, what did they do in indigenous societies? They would take a transgressor, like for instance, I think they had different methods, but they'd put him in the middle and they'd laugh at him. They'd shame him in front mm -hmm. of everyone, you know? Yeah. The, the tribe, the tribes around, and, and they're shaming this person, not killing him. You know, right, the, right. Like he did. Well, well, could we shame Putin? Could the rest of the world just say, we're, we are, you shoot, we're not shooting back, but we're going to, as a world, scream back at you that we see you. I don't know. I don't know. Could we? Is there some yeah. way we could shame someone who, who does something like that? Or... Or what? Or what? I'd yeah. love to see a serious conversation about it. Because yeah. it really is, what do you do when somebody comes and shoots you, you know? Yeah. I, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, and, and I will tell you that I would be uh, uh, standing lockstep with you in, in, in that effort simply because regardless of what somebody might say about, no, 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 we need to fight. I say, excuse me, hold it. Do you know what the definition of insanity is? Einstein defined yeah. it and you are insane. 
because you want to use the same solution over and over again. And it's never, and again, no, I, 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 I've heard this said that when you start making comments, I don't mean any offense. And what I'm about to say is going to be offensive. I don't mean any disrespect because I'm about to be disrespectful. No, mm -hmm. I genuinely do not wish to be disrespectful, but every human being from the beginning to the present who has fought for his or her tribe has died in vain. And here's the reason why. Because we're still fighting. We haven't learned. We haven't yet on that front. So I'm with you on that. And I, hey, what's it going to hurt? Hey, so, all right, we shame the person. All right, we do that. And then we send them to therapy. <laughs> well, when, or, or we give them psychedelics. <laughs> or we give them some. And, you know, that's another thing, too, with the veterans that... Um, you know, I, I was asking this question in regards to another interview that I did in regards to our veterans. I said, when when did it start that our government uh, turned its back on its its veterans who they asked to go fight their wars, whether it was domestic or international? And they told me, they said, oh, uh, it started with the Revolutionary War. We did not now. The, di the only difference is in World War II, this is what I heard just yesterday, that uh, this veteran from World War II said that it took them two to three weeks to get home from their, their, their various theaters in World War II. So they had a chance to commiserate. They had a chance to talk to each other about what they'd been through. They were kind of worked through a lot of the stuff. But for example, Vietnam, which was uh, one war where you'd come back and boy, you were hated. They didn't have that. They didn't get that opportunity because back in World War II, you didn't fly back necessarily. You came back home on a ship and it took a couple of weeks. Hmm. And I did an interview with a producer of a, a movie, a documentary called Welcome. And it had to do with the program for veterans. And I asked him, I said, so is our, our, our you know, do, do we need to help the veteran to better uh, acclimate to civilian life and he said no 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 we need to get the civilians to acclimate and understand where the veterans have been and then mm -hmm. you talked about previous cultures mm -hmm. when their men primarily went off to battle tribes and what have you when their men came home those who survived win or lose they were honored. They were respected. We, you know, and what do we do? We say, well, thank you for your service. Thank you for your Even service. Even the service, Richard. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? I, I, you know, I, I'm a woman and have never been threatened by draft. But if I had been drafted, I would have run away. Or it could put me in jail. I don't care. I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not going to shoot at people. Uh uh, what a you know here well it's your duty to be a soldier when it is yeah uh, uh and now you become a killing machine but then you come home and you have to be cooperative you can't kill anybody anymore you know i i, I it i feel so for people who have had to live through that and how difficult and yeah. and that's where actually you know some of the psychedelic therapy is very helpful oh uh, yeah they're they're know. proving it now scientifically yeah. they're they're, yeah, they're just, and I will Get tell them you that out of the guilt and and the yeah. pain and the memories, you know, yeah. to tune them into something deeper yeah. that they can somehow dissolve yeah. all yeah. of that uh, horrible kind of yeah. you know mental illness that that results. But yeah. you know, humans are not meant to be killing machines. No, I, and I also no. think about you know, you talk about countries. Russia is our enemy. Russia is not the little citizens, the people in their houses. I don't think so. It's people in the war room, whoever, you know, the dictator or his, mm -hmm. yeah. his mob, killing millions of people. Yeah. It, in, and then the, the whole country is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Well, I mean, we are just really quite crazy. Yeah, I, I, we are. We are a little bit. It is a little bit crazy. Okay, I'll uh, send a million people out to be killed. That, that's good. That's my job. I, I'm the dictator. So. Yeah. You know, no, no, that's not a good job. <laughs> yeah, no, not really. 
Uh, Suzanne Taylor, I, I would like to thank you for uh, giving us so much time here on the program. We talked about a lot of different things and gone down several different roads. And one of the roads that I would love to come back and talk about is what you were referring to, a conversation about some different ways of handling uh, people who are, are uh, we'll put it this way, misbehaving in our society, uh, who are still living by the old paradigm. But I'd also like to talk in a future program uh, about in your life, in your work that you especially are doing now, the role of what we talk about often on this program, your intuition. We encourage people during the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, to go within and listen to that still small voice for that guidance and so forth. So I'd love to have you back to talk Always. more about that. But Always. You know, uh, I want to make sure they know where to find me, though. If you go to Sue Speaks, you mentioned that before. It's suespeaks.org, and that'll send you out to everything that you could find about me, suespeaks.org. And we will be linked to that, to that website. Okay. okay. So people can click on it and, and off they go. Um, I have three final questions that I like to ask all of my guests, but before uh -oh. I do, I want to thank you for listening to and watching. Tell me your story, new paradigms for a new world where we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday mornings at 1 a.m. Wednesdays at 9 a.m. That's our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And then Monday through Friday from 8 to 9 a.m. And these programs, you can hear them because uh, we stream them live at those times at richarddugan.com. We podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music. We're on YouTube where you can watch these conversations. I hope you'll subscribe. And also click notification. So when I post a new conversation, you'll know about it and you'll be able to tune into it. And we also ask that if you can support the work we're doing financially, you'd like to be a part of what we're doing to change the world for the better for everybody. We have a PayPal account. It's there for your security as well as ours. When they ask you for the email address to whom you are sending, Richard at richarddugan.com. That's Richard at richarddugan.com. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, Please take time during this, the decade of perfect vision, the 2020s, to spend time in that quiet, peaceful, calm, still place, listening to that still small voice. With all of that, we now go to our final three questions for our guest. And the first of those is, who is Suzanne Taylor? Oh, you didn't warn me about this. Now, let's see. <laughs> Off the top of my head, who is Suzanne Taylor? I an unusual person who's trying to do what really nobody else is trying to do, which is come up with how we can do something uh, immediate that can make a significant impression on this misguided world we live in. Mm -hmm. So everybody else is looking for long-term solutions, but I'm looking for what we can do now before some catastrophe does us in or mm -hmm. makes us change. What is it that gets you up in the morning? Well, my enthusiasm about being a human being, about this privilege I have of really being able to do just what we're doing now, you know, to be uh, to help the world. I, this is such a gorgeous world. I want it to be as good as it can be. So thinking about that gets me up. And finally, what was your best day? Oh, <laughs> well, you know what comes to mind? Kind of funky. Um, when I was in school, I was the brains. And other girls were the sexy girls or, the, the, you know, the, the sex pots, whatever. And that's not quite the right way to describe them. But, you know, the mm -hmm. whatever. They weren't the brains. The popular they were, girls. They were the looks. <laughs> All right. So, so in my high school, which was a very, a very juicy high school, a lot of students. Um, the the um, cheerleading squad was juniors and seniors, pretty much. Every once in a while, a sophomore would make the juniors. And they had auditions every year. So um, I, no chance I was ever going to get there because I'm the brains. I'm not the brawn or what, no, the beauty. And But, you know, you have to audition. You have to try out. Everybody tries out. So I tried out for cheerleader. I made cheerleader in my sophomore year. So not only was I not supposed to be a cheerleader to begin with, but I made it in this year 
nobody, it was, you know, quite an accomplishment to be a cheerleader in your sophomore year for the next three years. So I tell you, that was when I got that phone call, I still remember you made it. I what? (laughs) (laughs) If you're talking about a thrill, you know, it wasn't the most important thing that ever happened to me, but I think it was the most thrilling. (laughs) Mm. Then, so as then I got to cheer, you know, enthusiasm has its root in entheos, the God within. And I got Mm. to be enthusiastic by design, you know, I had permission mm. to get excited and get everybody else excited. It was a perfect job for me. So, wow. <laughs> T E well, A M. Yay, team. <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't you. throwing each other around at the time. I would never have made that one. <laughs> it was an earlier <laughs> incarnation of cheerleading where we just yelled and screamed and, oh. you know, threw up our legs and <laughs> whatever. Well, I have to tell you, you are a delight to talk with. I thank you so much for giving us so much time. And I look forward to having you back on the program again. Love to. Bring me back. I will. I will do that. I'll be sending you uh, some emails in that regard. Uh, And I thank you folks for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story. And until our next broadcast podcast video cast, love to love. Jeanette, I am still listening. Dad, continue to be happy because I am. Smokey, I'll see you on the other side. And to my dear friend Zorro, aho, aho.